Brilliant. Hi everyone, I'm Harry, currently working upstairs at Clearleft. So this talk is about ramp up. This slide took me ages, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> I might have got into design mode and arrow and that. And the corner of the triangle doesn't quite meet up with the corner of the back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought I'd sort that out. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. That's the first time I've given this talk. I'm a bit nervous, actually. Um, anyway, yeah, so ramp up is sort of my phrase for about what you want users to do after onboarding and how to achieve it. So I know today's session is meant to be about personalization, but my talk is primarily about this. It involves personalization, but it isn't, it's sort of like a small niche of it, I suppose. Um, so in other words, once you've got users to set up a username and a password, what then? Um, so onboarding is kind of quite a fashionable topic at the moment. You see lots of articles and teardowns and that sort of thing getting shared these days on Medium or whatever. But the thing is, onboarding is just the first date. It's what happens next that matters. So um, every business has a series of steps that they want their users to go through, right? And in some cases, they haven't got it very well thought through. But those that have um, can describe how they expect users to progress from being a total newbie to a highly engaged expert who uses all the features and is a community advocate and that sort of thing. And those steps are usually referred to as the ladder of engagement, particularly in marketing. I think it's a kind of marketing term, but all of us should be using it in a way. <clears throat> so, and it's a really useful concept when you think about complex services or ecosystems that have depth and sort of nuances. So, you know, things that, yeah, depths that you want the users to get to, like eBay or Twitter, for example, it's not so useful for sort of, sort of straight e-commerce or single function apps. Um, so, you know, like if it was Yo, or something like that, it's not, such, not so important um, because there's only one step, you know, use it, that's it. Uh, so going up each step in the ladder takes effort um, and there has to be a clear benefit to the user and the design has to be very carefully considered and that's kind of what the talk is all about, really. Um, before I get carried away with theory, though, let's start by looking at what people tend to get wrong, so some of the anti-patterns. So let's start with Evernote. Evernote were valued at a billion dollars in 2012. That's quite a lot of money, a billion dollars. Apparently they're now struggling. So let's look at what their onboarding and their ramp-up experience is like. Uh, this is the homepage. It says that Evernote is an app that will make my life less complicated. Okay, so if I put in my email address and password, my register, I end up here. And it's telling me some really abstract things like Get organized, work together, stay productive. It's like my parents talk to me about it, I haven't seen them. Um, so these are kind of just values. I'm no wiser as to what it's really about. Uh, and then if I click the green button and click create, uh, I go to create my uh, first note, this is where I end up. So it's like, well, kind of I'm in, an, in the interface now. It's kind of blank screen syndrome. I've got no idea what I'm doing. It wants me to create a note. And when you start writing a note, you know, the formatting bar, bar appears there, so you're like, okay, it's some sort of word processor, you know, taking you sort of a thing. Now, Evernote is meant to have a unique value proposition, and it's not really come across, coming across here. We've gone through the whole funnel, basically. We're signed up now. What is it? So, it's, I, from, judging from that, I reckon that they have sort of hundreds of thousands of users who get here and just stop. You know, they'll run one note like this, and then just never come back. And what's more, what makes it worse is they've got loads of different apps. You've got the desktop app, the web app, the, web app, the web clipper, Skitch, Penultimate, Scannable. Then you've got lots of integrations. They've actually got hundreds of integrations, like other apps that you can kind of connect. So it's like they're focusing on the experts right at the top of the ladder while totally ignoring the people at the bottom. The bottom is like this big kind of gaping chasm that the users have to work out how to cross with their own accord. It's like if it was a ladder, you'd have one row at the bottom and then a massive gap and then a few more at the top, right? Um, so, you know, honestly, it feels like such a silly mistake. We shouldn't even need to talk about it here, right? But Evernote aren't the only ones. Uh, it's kind of our responsibility as designers or as product owners to help users understand our products so they can benefit from them. And there's another even more popular anti-pattern that's the opposite of this, which is kind of weird when you think about it. You're kind of anti-patterns at the opposite ends of the scale. <clears throat> a bit of animated kick there. Um, and, and it's the idea that you can sort of download instant expertise into someone's brain as part of the onboarding process. 
So most apps, you recognize these sorts of carousels, right? You sign up, download an app, and the first thing you see is sort of three to five pages with these dots along the bottom uh, of stuff that basically they want you to memorize. And then in theory, you'll look at that and go, fully memorized, and then, then you're in, right? Uh, but in reality, nobody reads any of this shit. They just go, next, next, next. Um, and, and then they start, and they want to see what it's really like. You know, it's like that old thing, nobody wants to read, read the manual, right? And coach marks, you probably recognize this sort of pattern here. They're just as bad. So you have sort of a translucent gray overlay, a bunch of labels and a bad handwriting font, and like some arrows. And it's the same thing, it's front loading, but it's just got a different aesthetic. Um, and the other main anti pattern I want to mention today is email over reliance. So this is the idea that um, helping users develop a deep understanding of your app is somehow a marketing problem that can be punted over to the people who do the email marketing and just let them deal with it in entirety. And the problem with this is that, you know, if you want to teach users about a subtle detail in your app, when, when's the best time to talk to them about it? Is it when they're inside the app and you've got, fully got their attention and they're about to use that feature? Or when they're outside the app? And they're checking their email, and maybe you, you're competing with like dozens of other crappy emails, emails from their parents, from, from their bank, whatever. So you may have got five percent of their attention at best. And relevance, the relevance of that sort of subtle detail that you want to talk to them about is completely lost because they're not thinking about that. They're thinking about you know, what's going on tonight. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, computer games. There's a lot. We can, the computer games are always ahead in terms of UX, aren't they? They're always kind of a few years ahead of product design, or digital product design. Um, so Mario Brothers, 1985, World 1-1. One, one. Um, this, teaches you, this teaches you how to play the game in a really clever way. It's all about timing, basically, sequencing. So the only thing you can do at this point, right at the beginning, is run left and right. I mean, the only thing you need to do at this point is run left and right. Uh, so it's the most basic controls. And then you're exposed to your first enemy, which means you're, you're basically being taught how to jump. So if you don't jump, you can't get any further. So from, from this point, from, from that point there, the designers of the game can assume that jumping is a thing that you can do, uh, and the level, the level design gets more complex as a result. Uh, and then a few seconds later, you get to these pipes. And these pipes are basically saying that the longer you hold the jump button, the higher you go. So it's the next thing you need to learn in the sequence, and now that of engagement. So they're saying, yeah, they're, they're basically saying, here's the simplest feature, let's make sure they're comfortable with that, then the next one, the next one. As you're playing, you have no idea that it's been gently sort of fed to you. Um, it's all about context and timing, and it's all done inside the app as you're using it, right? It's not, you're not getting emails going, step two of your Mario onboarding, uh, how to jump. Um, <laughs> right, okay, so now the talk, talk is going to change gears a bit. It's going to be a game of let's pretend. So let's pretend you've recently got a job working as a product manager on a running app. So it's an app like uh, Night Plus, uh, like Runkeeper, or Matt Moran. Uh, let's pretend it's 2007. That makes it easier because that's before there's any other running apps come out. So we're the first one, so we don't need to worry about being unique in the marketplace. Kind of. that's, not, that's not a problem here. So as part of your new job, you decide to speak to each of your colleagues. You go around the business and have a quick chat with everyone, right? And you go and ask them, what have you learned from our customers recently that we could use to improve our product? So first, you go and speak to the user researcher, okay? And they say straight away, oh yeah, there, there is that one new feature that nobody's using. We built this UI a month ago, and nobody's using it. So the idea of this is that a user can set their own goals, then the app will track how well they're doing, or how they're doing, and it will give them encouragement. And this tested, in the usability testing, tested well with keen runners, but not with the first timers. So they're like, well, what do we do with it? We've got this great new feature. Where do we put it? So as a result, this bit of the UI has ended up in the settings area. It's like kind of like the man draw area of the... It's like all the kind of features that we don't quite know what to do to. Let's just drop them in sort of settings and let people sort of find it there and sort it out. Stuff that we don't have confidence in. Right, so yeah. Thinking back to the Mario example, surely there's something clever we can do with targeting. Maybe we can use a targeted user interface component to promote this feature. To, you know, to savvy users, but not to first-timers. But then, thinking about it, targeting sounds a lot like targeted ads. And the only people who like targeted ads are people who make money from them. Even worse are the ones that follow you around the web. So here am I on ScrewFix trying to buy something for my bathroom. 
and then uh, all of a sudden that ad is following me absolutely everywhere, right? Um, this, this happened to me quite recently. My kids were at the toilet seat and I was trying to buy some hinges for Lucy. <laughs> Suddenly I'm toilet seat hinge man. It's like, oh, right. it's like I don't want to be defined as a person. Um, so we really don't want to go down that road. Um, but on the other hand, there is a distinction between what the advertisers are doing and what we want to do. What we want to do is help users get more out of our app. We want to declutter the UI. We want to avoid front loading, all those examples I showed you at the beginning. That's what we're trying to achieve um, by using targeting. And what advertisers are doing is like kind of foisting their stuff on people when they, at the moment which they don't want to see it. So this sort of a style of thinking can give rise to a design principle, one of our principles for how we're going to go about designing this thing that we're making. We can use this technology in a good way, so long as we stick to this core principle, which is respect the user. Don't obstruct them. Don't distract them. <coughs> so unlike people in advertising, we're in the business of helping people and making a product that they'll value even more. So, with this in mind, the idea of a targeted call to action before justifying it now. It's kind of advertising-like, isn't it? The idea of having a slot that you fill uh, with information based on the user's profile. But the idea of that is a perfectly honest thing to do, as long as we do it right. So, if our main home screen is a feed, so imagine this is a home screen, is all, this is all stuff about uh, like running activities that you've done or your friends have done, and we inject a card here, um, that tells our target segment about this feature and entices them to try it. So our target segment is someone who has some, some level of experience, right? And I, I call this a nudge, this kind of component, because it's about respectful encouragement and not heavy-handed coercion. So we've got a nudge component. That means we've got a standard way to present little bits of educational information in a non-invasive way now. So next, go and speak to the designer. And they say, oh yeah, there is, there is one thing, actually. It's a route planner. You can see I didn't bother doing a mock-up. This is struggle. But let's pretend that's our logo on the top corner and there's no orange there. It's kind of our brand colors and stuff. But we've got a route planner. Uh, and the tricky thing is that it's actually an expert feature. So it's confusing for beginners to see a route planner. Because you don't actually need to go and plan a route before you go on a run, right? You can just go out. If you happen to sort of run across a segment that already exists, then you'll be tracked across that segment and see yourself on the leaderboard. So you can, you can be an ad hoc runner, that's the whole point of our app. You don't need to plan anything. It's pretty confusing to show this in the onboarding sequence. We want to put it somewhere else. Yeah, it is a useful feature because we want people to be able to go and create routes. Sounds like the exact same sort of problems before, right? Maybe we can do another triggered nudge, like this. So now we're talking about a way to systematically analyze the user's context so we can work out which nudge to show them at exactly the right time, the right place when they're in the right mood, the right competency level to react positively to it. <clears throat> so what we seem to be talking about so far seems pretty simple. I don't know if you've used if this then that, or perhaps you're even a developer who kind of understands this stuff naturally. It's a bit like if this then that, isn't it? If the user has completed five runs, they're getting the hang of the app, so let's show them a nudge in a given slot in the UI, asking them to set goal. If we want to target really serious runners, then we can create this sort of a rule that's triggered if they completed a popular route, maybe in the top 30% of the time. So they're a really keen runner, they're kind of achieving a lot. So, interesting conversation you have there. Next, on to the lead developer. And they say, oh yeah, actually, yeah, we've, we've got a thing we want to talk to you about. Very few people have opted into the OS notifications. <coughs> Not talking about the kind of annoying kind of notifications you get on the left talking about meaningful ones like these. Uh, so that's, with Fitbit, they, did, they have a sort of tracking feature like we talked about earlier. So it's telling me how much more work is needed to hit the goal that I've set myself. Notifications are good because they drive people back into the app, gives people awareness of the goals that they would have otherwise have forgotten about. But, you know, we can't just tweak, tweak the onboarding sequence because we've got loads of people already on board. We've already got customers. We need to sort them out. So what do we do? Well, Pretty simple, right? We've already got this system in place. Uh, so, yeah, we can say if they've got notifications off, then show up asking them to turn them on, pretty much. And we can so maybe a modal dialogue instead of the uh, sort of in feed nudge, because it's that much more important. It's a kind of higher priority thing. It's like a roadblock in a way, this sort of a nudge where it doesn't let them into the app until they've, they've said, I'll do it, or no, I don't want to do it now. So, that would probably work. 
So at the end of your day of interview, you've been around the whole business, right? You talked about the first day, you've gone and spoke, spoke to everyone in the business about their ideas. You end up with this huge list of actions, basically. And this is, uh, in a way, that's kind of a problem of going department, from department to department, right? You're asking for ideas, and you're going to end up with loads of low-grade ideas, and you're going to get people saying ridiculous stuff, like, I want a pony. You know, it doesn't cost me anything, I'll ask for everything that I can possibly ask for. So all the kind of crap needs to be stripped out. But let's imagine, because you're the product manager, you can, you, 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 can, you can do that if you want to. You still end up with stuff, though. Stuff that you can't ignore. Stuff that is important for growth. We've still got a fair old list there, right? So can we just take our if-then-else table? What we so far, right? Can we just take that and... Um, Expand it to cover all ten of the actions that we have on the last screen. Getting a bit complicated, isn't it? Has anyone got any ideas what will happen if you just build this as it is? If we go out all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, everyone's going to go quiet then, not I would then do a big reveal. But um, <laughs> fine. <laughs> yeah. The problem is around <laughs> consistency of behaviour, right? User A happens to have a profile that doesn't trigger any of the nudges. So they'll far up the app, they get no modals, they'll go into their feed, there's nothing in there, they go for a run, they finish it, they, get, they don't get mad about anything. Um, and they're happy, and they're saying it's a great app. And user B, on the other hand, happens to have a profile that triggers everything, absolutely everything. So they'll far up the app, they'll see two modals in a row, then they'll check their feed, it'll be four nudges, there'll be no actual content, it'll just be us encouraging them to do stuff that drowns out what their friends are doing. Then finally, when they finish the going for a run, there'll be another modal saying, hey, don't forget to post onto Facebook, whatever. And it's a crap experience. And they'll, they'll say, this is rubbish. I don't want it anymore. Please, it. Right, pretty much. So what do we need? Based on this chain of logic that I've taken you through, what we seem to need is some sort of management system that controls the overall experience of the nudges. Right? Everyone with me? Yeah. <laughs> And the management system means the following things, I think. So I'm kind of, it, this talk is kind of a lot of stuff I've been working on recently, but it's not like it's not like a finished idea. It's 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 kind of the it's what I'm currently working on, and I'm sure there'll be a lot to learn from the other speakers. So bear that in mind. They may have other things to add to this. Um, so firstly, what do you need in your management system? You need a rate limiter. So for, for simplicity's sake, let's say we only want to show one nudge per session. Keeping it simple. Um, we also need some way of prioritising the nudges. So if you're going to show, only going to show one at a time, which one do you show? Uh, you know, maybe we can give them a priority score. So if more than one gets triggered, your system will choose the, one, choose the one with the highest priority score. Or maybe you can just use randomization if it's quite a simple problem. And they run into it quite a lot, that bit of UI, then you just randomly show different things, and eventually everyone will see the same sort of stuff. Um, there's lots of ways you can prioritise things. Uh, it'll also be sensible to have some sort of snooze or an off feature. So if the user taps no thanks, you actually say, we actually respect that and remember it, and say, I'm not going to annoy them about that again. Or if they say maybe later, you'll go, I will, I will annoy you about that again, but not for a while, maybe a few weeks. And that's useful because it frees up the slot. It recognises that the user doesn't want to hear about this stuff now and it means that slot's empty and you look like they're more like they're more likely to act on in that place. And then finally, some sort of data structure, a decision table or something like that that holds all of the rules. And I'll just leave that on screen for a second because this it took me ages to get this stuff together. I kind of invented this from scratch. There's probably there's probably uh, a bunch of email automation tools that already have this sort of stuff in, but as someone who works in UX, I've kind of stumbled into this area and kind of invented this stuff in the the course. Um, so yeah, rate limiter, prioritizer, some sort of snooze feature and decision table. Those are the kind of main things of the, for the management system. So once you've got a management system in place, then you need to work out what kind of settings you want. You know, if you've got like a graphic equalizer, it's all about tweaking the dials at this point. And, and that will define the personality, like working out how naggy it is, for example. So Dropbox, for example, they've got, they're, they're really famous for having a really well-defined ramp up sequence and that doing great virally and loads of growth off of it. Um, but they're very restrained about it. Um, you know, they don't take every opportunity to hit you with a light box to tell you what your next step is to ramp up. If you log into the website, you'll see you've usually got just a tiny little nudge down there, left. 
So it's kind of a refined experience. And I think it's because they know they want to be part of your operating system. And so in order to get that kind of honor to be there, they need to be, they can't, they know they can't be really brash. Uh, so they're really restrained, and that's how they've gone about defining their personality to get the growth that they want. Um, compare that to Skype. Skype.com, it's the world, the world of difference. So this is the kind of website, not the app. Um, so when you log into the Skype website, you get this, this kind of massive sales nudge in the middle of the page. So they really, really want me to buy a subscription, right? They know what they want. Um, they clearly think it's more important than whatever I wanted to do when I came to the site. It's all about them going, buy this. So they've ignored my historical relationship. I've, I've actually only ever bought one type of subscription ever before. And they're failing to offer it to me here. They're talking about subscriptions generally. They could be sort of saying, this guy's bought a subscription on and off 10 times, always the same one, because showing that. What about the other features and things that he's probably wanting to do as he's logging in? So personality-wise, this is what Skype is like. It's, it's like Dorian finding Nemo, right? It's total amnesia. Every time I log into Skype, it says the same thing. It's trying to sell me the exact same thing. And amnesia is not, not a good basis for a relationship. Uh, Facebook Messenger. It's another example of how the characteristics of your ramp-up system defines your app's personality. So with this, if you turn notifications off, you see this you, know, you see this model every time you start the app. Uh, remind me later. And that actually fades out. So if you if you keep tapping that and uh, it comes back, it becomes less and less visible. Um, <clears throat> so basically Facebook see their own goals as much more important than yours. They want to, you know, they want to kill SMS, they want to kill WhatsApp and all the other messenger apps. It's all about total domination. But, um, so, like their their approach is basically just to say "fuck you" to the users. You're going to use the app with notifications on, or you see this annoying, annoying mobile every single time you start the app. Personality-wise, they're a bit like this. I don't know if you see that. But yeah, it's a Star Trek reference. <laughs> so yeah, they're like the board. They're they're Borg. They're relentless, and they'll stop at nothing to convert you. See conversion. It's a conversion rate optimization pun. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> anyway, if we take the four themes of the talk, they actually make up a set of design guidelines, right? We've got respect the user, analyze the context, manage the experience, and imbue a personality, which also spells ramp down the side. <laughs> it be ages to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I mean, I'm hoping that I've shown that these guidelines are important kind of creating an effective ramp-up system, right? <coughs> um, shit, I may have the wrong slide there. Right here. It's like notes going, now do this case study. Mm. Blank screen. Um, shit, I am trying to look the wrong deck. You know what, I'm just going to carry on with this deck, and hopefully it will be fine. <laughs> the new one that would have been slightly better. Um, so yeah, so I'll talk you through a case study or two, and then I'll finish. Um, so, right. oh, okay, yeah, I've still got this slide. This will work. Um, so, um, I worked at the Telegraph uh, a year or two ago, I'm working on their digital edition app, right? So, this is the app where you read, <coughs> effectively read the print edition on your, whatever, your, your iPhone or your iPad or whatever. Um, and the app we were replacing had a ramp-up model that I didn't think was very good. So, if we think of the ramp-up experience, this is the old model I'm going to sort you through now as a graph with investment, kind of like effort, investment on the vertical axis and time on there, then this is the kind of problem they had originally. So when you first install the app, you go through a minute or two of onboarding. That's what that little pink bit is there. Uh, and then your only option is to go into a one month free trial. And one of the oddities of their design at this point is they didn't know who you were. They didn't capture the email addresses. So they had no idea who you were. They couldn't market to you. If you dropped out, if you cancelled, just gone. Um, and when, when the month is over, you basically either start paying then or you go, oh, you, know, you, you know how people put a thing in their calendar saying oh, that the trial's running out. So a lot of people would cancel at that point. Some people are going to become a paying subscriber. So um, let me just have a think. <laughs> um, so basically, yeah, one month, deal, one month in, the deal is basically pay or go away. And that seemed a bit brutal to me. It's, it's like quite a... It's like a door that you either have to go through and stop paying or slammed in your face. You can never go in that door ever again. It's over. 
Uh, and what I, what I kind of thought at the time was, we should be able to sort of be a bit more gentle with people, kind of have some tears and that maybe suit people with different states of mind. So this is the new model that we came up with. When you install the app, you go straight into the newspaper itself, so you don't fill any forms, you're straight into reading the content. Uh, you get one free week, and then when that week is up, you reach a branch point. Um, if you want, you can register and get a further free couple of weeks. Um, or you can click no thanks, and you go into a meeting mode. So instead of kicking them out at that point, I should have practiced my slides. This, this is the new bit that I don't really remember, remember that one. Um, what am I trying to tell you on this slide? So, um, yeah, I mean, the idea is that yeah, if you go into this, this bit here, you're going to get a few articles. You might get one free article a day. So it's like a toe in the water. So even if you don't use the app for a few months, it's still there. You can still open it up. You can still read the paper, right? It's, there's still a chance that you might still want to use it. Whereas with the old system, if you opened up the app, it, you, it would still remember going, well, you didn't, the free trial ended. As far as we're, we're concerned, you're, you're a done deal. We're not interested in you until you start paying. So it's a way to have a gradual way to engage with users. And then we basically have another stage there as well. So... Um, the principle is to basically never ever show them the door and gradually entice them up through the stages. You're either anonymous or you've registered with your email address. That goes on for a couple of weeks and ultimately you do ask you to pay, but even if you don't want to, then you can still stay on this kind of the sort of poor man's tier here where you just get a few, few free uh, articles per week. Right, finally I explained it. Good. Um, so this model seems, it's like when you draw the graph, it's like, yeah, this is how it should work. It's like, hang on a minute. It's got loads of different nudges we need to present people now. It's like, how are we going to work out what to show people when uh, and how and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, so, you know, the whole point of the app is to allow you to just read the paper and <coughs> to deal with, like, loads and loads of pop-ups, right? Um, so I came up with this kind of UI, or this design process, basically. First, you identify the UI slots, uh, then you work out the sort of sequence, the key user actions, then you build personality, prototype it, and test it. Um, so these are the UI components. Um, the info bar, being that, which you probably recognize from various browsers you use and stuff, and the modal here on the right. And this is one of the decision tables. And what's kind, of, what's kind of neat about using a decision table is you can just do it in Google Docs. And that means everyone in all the other departments you're working with, like people in marketing or whatever, they can all go and see it and picture how it works. So basically, the, the table works by analyzing each line at a time, and then when you hit a line that's been activated, then that will be active. And that bit of UI gets shown, so it kind of clicks through it. It's like highlighted, something like that. And that defines the behavior of the UI. So this one here is asking for feedback on the app. This will go away if the user either clicks, uh, the other gives feedback, or they close it. And it will not come back until the next version of the app is released. Uh, so you can see we've got other things like age out here, which is basically, should this thing just kind of die of its own accord, even if they never touch it? Should it or should it just sit there forever, like lingering around the bottom of the screen? In this case, we said, no, we want to be kind of aggressive. You can see we have the opportunity to turn it on, but uh, the marketing team are like, no, I'm making everything infinite. Um, but it's, it's, use, it's a useful framework to think about, isn't it? And this item, on the other hand, it can't be muted, this one. This one has no mute behavior. Um, so all they can do now is buy a subscription or wait until Monday morning. See? Up there. They basically, they either, either buy it or they just wait until Monday morning when they, their meter gets replenished and get a few more free articles. So I might dwell on this because the tables are super boring. It's like talking through a spreadsheet is not a fun sort of uh, uh, presentation. But um, the point of showing you this is so you can see how the values here specify the personality of your app. If you want it naggy or if you want it restrained, this is where you define it, right? That's the point. Uh, and the configuration for this actually ended up being in, like an XML file on a server somewhere. So if we changed it overnight, it would just kind of propagate onto all of the people's devices and suddenly start behaving differently. So that is pretty much everything I've got for you today. And I just want to leave you with some passing thoughts. So what I find quite strange about UX design at the moment is we're all familiar with this idea of personalised content, right? But like most of the apps we use all the time are totally personalised, like you know Facebook, Twitter, even Amazon. But somehow we all don't employ the idea of ramp up, like personalisation in ramp up. It seems like a really cool idea. I've not heard anyone else talking about it, and that's why I wrote this talk when I came here today to kind of find. And if any of you are doing this stuff, do come and talk to me afterwards. Um, you know, I think I think UX people should think about this as part of their job every day. 
I think that's kind of my main message, really. Um, I thought that was the end. It's not the slide, so <laughs> there you are. <laughs> <laughs> Question? Yeah. Sounds good. Thank you. <laughs> no questions? No, I have no questions. Well, there's one there. 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 Well, that's what I was kind of trying to say is that I, it all seems to make a lot of sense and I think the way I see it a lot of people should be working on this stuff but it's not a road that well travelled um, and well we'll see from a couple of the other talks today maybe they'll have some other answers uh, what were the last two parts in your acronym <laughs> what ramp yeah oh, well, it's just ramp I didn't have a that was just no just the, the M and the P um, I can't remember <laughs> don't <you> remember. <laughs> <laughs> hang on a <sir. laughs> Um, uh, manage manage the experience yeah, and it. then personality um, but uh, I can per, no personify your app because it has to be done with a P so, so. Cool. there you go yes <laughs> Any, anything else yeah in terms of um, what you talked about how does because gamification seems to be kind of a process that fits with that is that something you've looked into in terms of Encouraging people to move forward based on using gamification as a process. I, I, I don't really think gamification is a process. I think it's a, it's a buzzword that was really fashionable a few years ago. Um, I think people. I think then people have used it in lots of different ways, and I think the people who've used it well probably matches it. I'm not people. But um, I, I think that people who've used it well probably don't even call it gamification anymore um, because that time's fallen out of favour. But yeah, there are aspects of that whole fad that are probably still valuable, but I think the term itself is, it, you know, it's, it's kind of badges and worthless stuff that people associate with it. So but I in terms of education, term. though, in terms of yeah. getting people to move down a funnel and using yeah. kind of what you're showing there as, yeah. as, as a process of maybe not, you know, get a badge, yeah. like that, but I mean, ultimately, the idea of kind of, you know, Mario that you use as an example, yeah. that kind of idea of educating them down the path. Yeah, but I think all... All user experience design involves user journeys and people ramping up and becoming more confident in using things. I don't, I don't think it's just gamification. I think there is stuff to learn from what, like what happened over the last few years with gamification. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel comfortable with suddenly going, "My stuff is gamification." It just seems like a bit cheesy. Are yeah, you a gamification expert? No, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no it, it, it's just the, the aspect of education that I was going yeah. to think of more of. Yeah. Know, as, as a process, it wasn't. I yeah. used all that shit. I didn't. Yeah. Um, it's yeah. more just yeah using yeah you are right fun yeah. as an educational process to get them to move down the funnel. Yeah. Um, in terms of what I was thinking as that as opposed to badges. Yeah. Badges. I was just yeah. thinking about badges. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, cool. Thanks, right, thanks, thanks very much. Yeah.